Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. We are beginning Philippians chapter 3 today, and the title of the message is Resurrection Joy. Resurrection Joy. Of course, a week ago, we celebrated Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and we talked about the true story of Christ's resurrection from the dead. But the implications of the resurrection continue in our lives. And as it happens, as we return to Philippians today, the theme is resurrection, the impact of Christ's resurrection for those who are in Christ. Father, we pray that you will be with us now during our time in your word, uh, that we will be fully focused upon you, knowing you, and the power of your resurrection. And I pray, Lord, that we will know the power of your resurrection even as we understand the kind of righteousness needed to get to the resurrection. And it's not a righteousness found in ourselves but a righteousness from you that comes through faith in Christ. And I pray, Lord, as you have these important truths in the passage before us today, that each mind and heart will be opened to fully understand what you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice uh, Philippians 3, verse 1 Paul begins this chapter by saying, finally, many have joked that he says finally, and there are two whole chapters to come. He was a good preacher. Uh, he, says, he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Once again, this theme of joy and rejoicing, and maybe at this point we're saying, all right, Paul, we get it. We get it. You want us to be joyful. And he continues in verse one, well, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. He's like, I got plenty of ink. I could write about joy all day. And the more I write about you finding your joy in Christ alone, that is a protective for your soul. Verse 2, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself, Paul says, have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. There is coming a time when each and every one of us, individually, will stand before God. You will stand before your maker. And there is nothing more important in this life than knowing that you are prepared to stand before your God. We prepare for all kinds of things, don't we? You prepare your meals. You prepared the wardrobe that you would wear today. You prepare for trips. You prepare for your retirement. 
But are you prepared to stand before your maker? What could possibly be more important than preparing for that moment? Paul knew he was going to stand before God. And he says in verse 9 of this text, I don't want to stand before God with a rubbish righteousness that is produced by me through keeping of the law. I want to stand before God with a resurrection kind of righteousness, the kind that is produced by God available through faith in Jesus. These are the two kinds of righteousness spoken of in this passage. And Paul first addresses the rubbish kind of righteousness that comes from me by law keeping. Paul got pretty fired up about a heresy that was threatening the early church. Not only the church in Philippi, but all the churches of that day. It was a threat to the purity of the gospel that was coming from a group called the Judaizers. They were also known as the Circumcision Party. You say, Circumcision Party? That, that sounds like a really lame party. <laughs> and, and yes, yes it was. It was a very lame party. They were detracting from the purity of the gospel of Jesus. Now we know that in the Old Covenant, God did require his people to be circumcised. It was very clear that God wanted all Jewish males as well as converts from other nations to be circumcised. And a question arose after Christ had came, lived, died, was resurrected, ascended. The church began, which included not only Jews, but Gentile believers as well. The question arose, should these Gentile converts to Christ be required to become Jews, including circumcision? This question was addressed in the book of Acts, chapter 15, and I want to ask us to turn there just for a moment. Hold your place, if you would, in Philippians 3, but turn to Acts, chapter 15, where this question was addressed thoroughly at an event called the Jerusalem Council. And we can see very clearly in this text the background to what Paul is now going to refer to in Philippians 3 some years later. Acts chapter 15, notice the specific claim in verse 1. Acts 15, 1 says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, notice, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Faith in Christ is not enough. You must also be circumcised and by implication keep the ceremonial law of Moses Otherwise, see it there clearly, you cannot be saved. That's the claim. So verse 2, after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, and brought great joy to all the brothers. Wow, Christ didn't just come to save Jews, but he's a light to all the nations. This is wonderful. Verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them, specifically their ministry to the Gentiles. But again, verse 5, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us, Jewish Christians, and them, Gentile Christians, having cleansed their hearts by faith. They've placed their faith in Christ, 
God's given them the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Peter continued to speak of all that God had done among the Gentiles. He also quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, the book of Amos. And it's always good, by the way, to go to scriptures where there is a debate about a matter. And after considering the scriptures, Peter's conclusion in verse 19, he says, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. This is Peter's conclusion, which was adopted by the council there at Jerusalem to be the verdict on this matter, that God does not require Gentile Christians to become Jews in order to be saved. Now, they shouldn't worship idols, they shouldn't sin, but they don't need to keep the ceremonial law of Moses. It's a very good thing that this council was led by the Lord to come to this conclusion. And Paul, having been a part of that council, made it one of his primary missions to keep the Judaizers at bay, to keep them from going around telling all these new Gentile converts that it's not enough to believe in Christ. There is more that must be added. Christ's work is not finished. Paul did his very best to keep this heresy at bay because adding to the gospel does not enhance the gospel. It ruins the gospel. Perhaps you heard the story from a couple of weeks ago about a security guard who was newly hired in an, at an art museum and there was a painting hanging in that museum valued at over a million dollars, a painting of three blank faces. And this security guard, on his first day of the job, being bored in the middle of the night and maybe sleep-deprived as well, decided to take out a pen, I'm not making this up, and draw faces on those blank faces of that million-dollar painting. Now, needless to say, he lost his job. Because adding to that painting didn't enhance the painting, it ruined the painting. And Paul knew that adding anything to the gospel does not enhance the gospel, it ruins the gospel. And so just as he had warned the churches in Galatia, just as he had warned the church in his letter to Rome, now he warns the Philippian church, beware of the circumcision party. Again, notice verse 2, he says, look out for the dogs. Now, some of you didn't know this was in Scripture. You're like, I've seen signs saying, beware of dog on backyard fences. I didn't know that was a quote from the Bible. It is. <laughs> Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. You say this sounds like strong language. It is. Soul-endangering heresy requires a strong rebuke and a strong warning. Look out for these dogs, Paul says. Now, when we picture the, the dogs here, we're, we're not meant to picture your well-bred golden retriever or your fluffy little cuddly poodle. You're meant to picture something more like a coyote, a scavenger grubbing around in the filth. Now, this word dog, with that kind of dog in mind, is a term that the Jews often used as an insult toward those who were unclean, those who were outside of the covenant community. But now Paul uses this term of the Judaizers not so much as an insult, but to point out the irony that they, in fact, are the ones who are unclean. They, in fact, are the ones outside of the covenant community. The term at the end of verse to mutilate the flesh also involves some irony. The pagans are the ones who practice genital mutilation. 
But Paul says about the Judaizers, if they are requiring circumcision outside of God's covenant purposes, they are doing nothing more than mutilating the flesh. Outside of its divine intent, circumcision is not only meaningless, it can be spiritually harmful because what God was after, his desire, was a spiritual surgery, a circumcision of the heart. And God began speaking of this as early as Deuteronomy chapter 30, promising a circumcision of the heart that would come and that was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Colossians 2.11 says, In Christ you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Because of what Christ has done, there is no more need for physical circumcision. By faith in him, our hearts have been circumcised. Paul goes on in verse 3 to say, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. Remember what happened around the Jerusalem Council where Peter testified, they have received the Holy Spirit, these Gentile Christians. They worship by the Spirit of God. They are the true circumcision, so to speak. We worship by the Spirit of God. We glory in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. See, circumcision was never supposed to be about self-righteousness. And those who understand the ultimate intent of the idea of circumcision are those who glory in Christ Jesus. Someone says to you, oh, you're, you're a Christian, are you? You're one of those people who thinks you're all that. And you say, no, 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 I don't think I'm all that. I think Jesus is all that. I'm not putting any confidence in anything that I have done. We glory in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh, even though, Paul says, if we're going to play that game, I can play that game. I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And here he lists his spiritual resume of self-righteousness. Now, he's doing so facetiously. He's not actually claiming this. He's just saying, if we're going to play that game, I can play that game. Verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day, and that is the exact proper day to be circumcised according to the law. He says, I'm of the people of Israel. I was born into the right nation, the right race, born into spiritual privilege. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, not one of those fringe tribes. No, we're, we're the loyal tribe. We're the tribe from, where, from which the first king of Israel came. Remember him, Saul? My parents named me after him to commemorate what a great tribe I'm from. A Hebrew of Hebrews. My family's not like those half-breed Samaritans or those Hellenized compromisers. I'm as Jewish as it comes. As to the law, he says, a Pharisee. I came through the religious school that holds the strictest stance on God's law. Verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. I had no tolerance for those blasphemers who worshipped that cursed, crucified imposter. I went after them. He says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. At least externally speaking. As far as could be externally seen and verified, he had followed the letter of the law to a T. Paul was exceptionally talented at the game of self-righteousness. He would have been a number one draft pick easily. But he quit the game. Not because he wasn't good at the game, but because he realized... It's a dumb game. The game of self-righteousness gets you nowhere. It does not cause you to stand before God acceptable in his sight. What's on your spiritual resume? You say, well, Pastor Mike, I was born in a Christian family. I was born in a country with a Christian heritage. I grew up in the church, and that's great. Thank God for all those privileges, but none of those things will get you into heaven. 
You say, well, I I read my Bible and I pray sometimes and I, I come to church. I'm even memorizing some verses because you're making me memorize these verses. And all those things are great, but none of those things will get you into heaven. And this is why Paul says in verse seven, whatever gain I had, notice, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Some of you work in banking and finance. He says, I thought those were credits. They were actually debits. Verse 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. See, when Paul on the road to Damascus was knocked off his high horse by the glorious risen Lord Jesus, he came to realize something. He came to realize that all of those works of self-righteousness that he thought were contributing to his standing before God were actually worthless. Imagine setting up a retirement account that's going to set you up for the end of your life. And you set it up so that every month there are automatic transfers into that account. But imagine after several years of this, monthly deposits going into that account, you realize to your horror that these deposits had been directed to a scam investment. And all of those deposits which you thought were gaining you a secure retirement turned out to be one big loss. You thought you were set for life, but in fact, you're bankrupt. Paul says, I came to realize this, that all of these religious deposits of self-righteousness, my spiritual privilege, my zeal, my scrupulous keeping of the law, it was all worthless. In fact, he says, it's worse than, worse, worse than, uh, bleh, tongue twister. <laughs> Good thing I'm not earning my way to heaven through my preaching, Amen. It's, it's worse than worthless. Notice the word there at the end of verse 8. It was, it was rubbish. Now, that's one way you can translate the word. It's the Greek term skubalon, which refers not just generally to waste, but a specific kind of waste, human waste. If you're reading the King James Bible, it's translated dung, And that is one of the more polite terms for it. You say, well, did Paul really use that word? That's that's strong language. Yes, but Paul is trying to make a strong and memorable point. You can take all those shiny trophies of self-righteousness up on my shelf and flush them down the toilet. That's where they belong. Now, it's going to mess up your septic system, but go ahead and do it anyway. Flush your self-righteousness down the toilet because it's worthless. There is a better righteousness available. Not the rubbish righteousness that comes from me by law-keeping, but the resurrection righteousness that comes from God by faith. And that's the second point of this passage to focus now on the resurrection righteousness that comes from God by faith. Notice again verse 8. We've already read this, but let's look at it again. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake... I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Boy, this is one of those phrases I wish I could just keep before my eyes every moment of every day. There is surpassing worth in knowing Christ Jesus. Whatever you lose, in pursuit of Christ is no loss at all as long as you gain him by faith. This was Paul's personal story. Think of what he had lost in bowing the knee before Jesus. He was set up pretty well. He was respected. 
He had a good career, probably a nice house and all the toys for the summer vacation. When he started following Jesus, he took on a second career, which was very different. This career involved being on the run, being harassed and beaten, persecuted, left for dead, no respect, thrown in jail. He had lost it all. And some of you know this story, at least to some extent. It has been costly for you to step away from a religion of self-righteousness. Some of you have a background of Roman Catholicism or being a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or some other religion that requires works to stand before God. And in stepping away from that, you lost respect, you lost friends, you lost your standing. Others of you have stepped away from a more secular kind of self-righteousness, the pagan religion of our day. You've decided to no longer bow at the feet of so-called science. You're no longer putting your ultimate faith in human governments. You're no longer worshiping at the altar of entertainment. You're no longer serving those wicked agendas of pagan autonomy and rebellion against the Lord and in doing that, you have lost friends. You have lost standing. You're considered an oddball in your workplace, in your classroom, even in your family. But Jesus is worth it. Count it all loss. Jesus is better. Jesus, uh, Paul said in verse 9, I just want to be found in him, found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, there's a lot going on in this particular verse, verse 9. It is a verse packed with doctrine that matters for eternity. I think we can take a little bit of time to wrestle with some multisyllabic terms and complex concepts in order to know that our eternity is secure. Is that a good trade-off? See, this verse is a very important one when it comes to our understanding of the doctrine of justification. Justification has to do with righteousness and in particular, having a righteousness that God accepts. Many of you have heard the name Martin Luther. He famously stated that justification is the doctrine that determines whether a church stands or falls. Justification is not God making me more righteous. That's sanctification. That's a different category. Justification is God declaring me righteous. You say, well, how can God declare me righteous? He'd have to be blind to declare me righteous. I know the stuff I've done. Well, no, notice again in verse 9, Paul says, this is not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Now, hypothetically, you could obey the law perfectly, externally and internally, and earn your way to heaven, but none of us have done that. See, the problem is not with the law of God. The law of God reflects God's holy and righteous character. The problem is with us. We can't match God's holy and righteous character. This is why Paul writes in another passage, Romans 3, that by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I hope we recognize, even though many falsely believe this, that God does not grade on a curve. Many think this way, don't they? Oh, God will accept me because I'm a little bit nicer than my neighbor. God does not grade on a curve. Perfection is the standard. And so God cannot declare us righteous based on our works. There's a wonderful story that Jesus told, and in fact, I'll I'll ask you to turn there. 
really important story in Luke chapter 18. I know I've got you turning a lot today, but I want you to see this for yourself and not take my word for it. Luke chapter 18. Jesus told the story of two men who went up into the temple to pray. This was a common thing that would have happened at this time, something observable to the people that Jesus was speaking to. And these two men, Jesus says in Luke 18, verse 10, one was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now, if you think you don't like the IRS, back in this day, they were even more corrupt So one, a scrupulous keeper of the law, knowing God's word inside and out. The other one, a corrupt tax collector. Jesus says in verse 11, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this way. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, perhaps even gesturing toward the tax collector. Extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. That was his spiritual resume. And notice that even though we can can sense the pride in these words, notice that he technically gives God credit for helping him with his righteousness. He says, God, I thank you for infusing this righteousness into me, which I can act out and thereby stand before you. But it was still his own righteousness that comes from the law, the kind of righteousness that is not good enough to bring before a holy God. Notice the contrast in verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, which one was justified? Jesus tells us very plainly in verse 14, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, the extortioner, went down to his house justified, not in the process of being justified, justified fully rather than the other, the Pharisee. The man who was justified instantly was not the man who proudly declared his spiritual resume, but the man who humbly cried to God for mercy. As we turn back to Philippians chapter 3, we see that this kind of righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God, notice again Philippians 3 verse 9, is the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Do you believe? That's the only question that matters. Do you believe? I have to imagine that one of the members of this church at Philippi, the jailer, might have thought back to a conversation he had had with Paul and Silas about 10 years earlier. As he fell trembling before Paul and Silas and he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas responded, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This righteousness from God is by faith. And it is a righteousness from God, not a righteousness that God helps you earn, but a perfect righteousness that was earned by Jesus. Jesus, the only man who lived a perfect life externally and internally. The only one who ever did it. As Jesus hung on the cross, there was a great exchange with the, which the prophet Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 53, 11, The righteous one, God says, my servant shall make many to be accounted righteousness and he shall bear their iniquities. 
Believer, here is what happened at the cross. The guilt of your sin was placed on him and he took your punishment. But not only that, the perfect righteousness of Jesus has now been placed upon you, giving you access to a holy God. Believer, be encouraged by this today. You are not in the process of being justified. You have been justified. God sees you right now clothed in the perfect righteousness of his son. You know that you are a long way from being practically perfect. Your spouse knows that very well. But you are already positionally perfect, not having a righteousness of your own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. And this true doctrine of justification is what makes biblical Christianity utterly unique when it comes to world religions. Every other faith begins by saying, do, D-O, do this, do that, do this ceremony, jump through this hoop, earn this much righteousness, do these things, and then you can make your way to God or nirvana or whatever it may be. Biblical Christianity is completely different. Biblical Christianity begins with D-O-N-E, done, It's been done. The perfect righteousness has already been earned. You begin by accessing that by faith. And afterward comes the doing, not because you're earning, but because you are in the family of God with new life through the Holy Spirit. But we never claim those things that happen after our justification. We continue to claim that and only that when we stand before the Lord. When you reach the gates of glory, if you are with Christ, they'll let you in. Paul said, I want to be found in Christ. It's the only way to get through. A few weeks ago, we took our family down to a a large indoor water park in southern Indiana, and uh, Uh, Some of the kids enjoyed it. Some did not as much. My five-year-old loved it. He absolutely had a blast in that water park. This particular water park had a number of very high, very fast, very fun water slides at one end of the park. And my five-year-old really wanted to do the big, big water slides. After about 20 minutes, he was tired of the little kid's slide. He's like, I want to go up to those. And I was like, well, we're going to check this out, but I think you might be a little bit too short to be allowed to do the water slide. So we walked over there together, and, and sure enough, at the bottom of those stairs, they had a sign there and the, the measuring stick, and you must be this tall in order to ride, and, and he, was, he was several inches short. But as I continued to read the sign, I saw that there was an exception clause. If you are with your parent, then you can ride. And so we walked up those stairs and we got to the top and the employee was up at the top of the steps with that stick, you know, to to make sure everyone's tall enough to ride. Otherwise, he could get in trouble and lose his job. And so he holds up the stick and my five-year-old was well short of the top of that stick. But he took one glance up at me and saw, oh, he's, he's with his dad. Come on through. Now, if my five-year-old had claimed his own height at that point, he would not have gotten through. Imagine the conversation. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just a few inches away. I haven't fallen that far short. Come on, just make an exception for me. Nope, they never would have. But he was with me, and my standing got him through. If you are found in Christ by faith, you will get through. Don't claim your own standing. You're short. You've fallen short of the glory of God. Claim Jesus' perfect righteousness. That's how you can stand accepted before God. Amen? Amen. My prayer is that none of you would leave this room claiming your own righteousness, but would be depending fully 
upon his perfect righteousness by faith. We say, well, Pastor Mike, I am. I'm depending fully in his righteousness. So that's it then. That's the end of it? No, again, that's just the beginning of it. Now you have entered the opportunity to know Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to walk with Jesus for the rest of your days and into eternity. This is where Bible reading comes in. This is where memory and prayer and good works come in. It's about knowing Jesus. Paul says in verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. But a wonderful thing to know Jesus is to know the power of his resurrection. To know that just as he rose from the grave, when my time comes, I will rise from my grave as well. But verse 10 continues, to know Jesus is also to share his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Well, hold up. I thought when I believed in Jesus, I mean, I knew I was signing up for resurrection. You're telling me I was signing up for suffering as well? Well, my friend, you don't get to resurrection without first going through death. Now, Jesus was very straightforward about this. He said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He didn't say put a small golden cross around your neck, although it's fine if you do that. He said take up this, this instrument of torture and humiliation and agony and death daily. And for many who have heard these words of Jesus and responded to his call, this has been quite literal suffering and death. I remember a few years ago hearing a story from our resident uh, church history expert, Steve Schlichter. He told the story of a famous comedian in the third century of the Roman Empire. So the third century equivalent to our modern day late night comedians, a man named Genesius who loved making fun of Christians. In fact, on stage, he had a very popular act that involved satirizing Christian baptism. And he would pretend to be baptized, but in the process would make a mockery of Christians. It was a very easy and popular thing to do at the time. Under Emperor Diocletian, the Christians were being terribly persecuted. You want to get in good with the state? Make fun of Christians. And he did so. Again, like the late night comedians, right? During one particular act, an act, by the way, at which Emperor Diocletian was present, Something happened to transform his heart while he was on stage. And he abruptly announced in the middle of that act that he had believed in Christ for real. The Christians are right. And in this baptism is actually my real baptism. I'm actually becoming a Christian. Well, to begin with, everyone thought he was joking. He's a comedian after all. He's just being satirical. But he continued to insist, no, I'm a Christian now and this baptism is for real. Well, Diocletian wasn't happy about that. So he said, let's make sure you're not joking. Will you continue to insist that you're a Christian under torture? And they put him through torture and he continued to insist, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not joking. And so he was beheaded. And this was not uncommon in the early church or even in the modern church in particular places where it is quite dangerous to publicly profess your faith in Christ. Next week we have a baptism class. In a few weeks we'll be having a baptism service. I would love for every one of you who is a believer in Christ but who has not yet been baptized as a believer to come to the class next week and prepare to be baptized next month. You say, well, Mike, that's a terrible way to set it up. You just told me the story of someone who died after he was baptized. Right, think about how easy you have it. And 
And, and look, I'm not making light of, of how difficult it can be to, to get up on a platform in front of people and share your testimony and get drenched in front of a room full of people. It's uncomfortable, but it's good for us to experience, even in some small way, that following Jesus and publicly identifying with him will be uncomfortable in some ways. But it's worth it. To be with Jesus on the pathway to resurrection and eternal life is worth any suffering that may come along the way. Paul says, count it all loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and knowing the power of his resurrection. Many of you will remember a far more recent story of martyrdom. Seven years ago, in 2015, when 21 Christian construction workers in Egypt were kidnapped by the Islamic State, these 21 men, just just average Christians, so to speak, they weren't pastors, they weren't missionaries, they were construction workers. These men were ordered to renounce their faith, and not a single one would do so. And so all 21 men were brutally beheaded on a beach. It was videotaped. The video was sent around the world. ISIS derisively labeled these men the people of the cross. And they were. But they were also people of the resurrection. Now, how in the world do you come to a moment like this where you are ordered to renounce your faith or die? I do not believe you will have the courage to hold on to your faith if it is a faith in your own righteousness. There's no assurance in that. But if your faith is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you can go through death knowing there is resurrection on the other side.